Hey everybody, this is the Entrepreneur Experiment and I'm Gary Fox. I'm going to get straight into today's episode because that's what today's guest advised me. Mr. Paddy Galloway is a YouTube consultant to the biggest YouTubers in the world and he's also an extremely successful YouTuber himself with his own channel. We break down what is YouTube, how do you make money from it and how he's built a consulting business from right here in Ireland that now generates over 1 billion views for his clients per year. Here is my chat with Paddy Galloway. Before we kick into that, let me just thank my three partners for season seven. First up, we have Bay Street Innovation. That's baystreet.io. Think of them simply as your technical partner. If you've got a business already and you're looking for automation or you're looking to bring some more technology into it, chat to Gareth and his team. Or if you've got an idea you want to bring to reality, Gareth and his team can bring a concept to life. Next up, we have chapter.ie. Deirdre and her team are a brand studio unlike any other if you have a brand that you're looking to reinvigorate or you have an idea for a brand, just simply call them. There's no other no other choice. Just call them. You're in the best hands in Ireland. And finally, findavenue.ie does exactly what it says in the tin. Sean and his team, if you're a corporate event organizer, they're the people to talk to. If you're looking to organize anything to do with your company, whether it's a party, a conference, a meeting, they'll organize everything from the venue, the entertainment, top to toe, and it doesn't even cost anything. That's findavenue.ie. Now, straight into my chat with Paddy Galloway. Paddy, welcome to the pod. It's great to be here. I was just, we were just laughing about my professional countdown. Very, very slick setup we have. Yeah, definitely. It gave me a, gave me a real butterfly, so it did. I feel like uh, the time is now. <laughs> okay, we're live. <laughs> is that better? <laughs> yeah. There Welcome to the pod, man. It's great to chat to you. You're someone I've followed for a long, long time. You put out absolute gold on Instagram and YouTube. What do you do? What do I do? I, that, that is a question that I, I always struggle with. It's, it's a hard one <laughs> because, I mean, technically, I'm a YouTuber who teaches other YouTubers how to do YouTube. So I'm a YouTuber <laughs> plus YouTube consultant. Um, essentially, I guess in, in like a, a really short way, I'm like Mr. YouTube. I just love YouTube. I study um, the platform every day. I've been doing it for well over a decade since I was a, a young fella. And I am lucky enough today to work with some really big creators, having them with their strategy. And I also have my own channel too, which um, I'm, I'm glad to hear you're a fan of where I um, break down how YouTubers have grown and try to provide some really good advice for creators of any size, 100 subs or 100 million. I try to make videos that can help them out. You've worked with a lot of big names. We'll get to them in a while. So basically, essentially, you have two parts to your business. You have your YouTube channel and then you teach other YouTubers how to be better YouTubers. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Um, it's, it's like, yeah, the YouTube side is like a content business. Essentially, I monetize through um, AdSense, which is just like marketing and um, people paying for ads on my videos. Um, and that content as it's in itself almost operates as inbound marketing for my consulting business because people watch the videos, they understand I have a good understanding of YouTube and the algorithm and different things. And then a lot of big creators will come to me and say, hey, I'd love for you to apply some of the stuff you know to our content. And yeah, it's, it's kind of, it's less of teaching and more of actually working with people to, you know, deliver results. So I go into a channel that maybe is getting 20 million views a month. And my goal for them is to get them up to 40 million views a month. Um, very specific, you know, and I, I do like a mix. So like some things will be like a retainer basis, just like a typical sort of agency would do. So I'd work with someone over a long period of time, but I also do some public stuff with um, people of any size. So any, any person on the street can just book in for like a one hour call with me and um, they're fun as well. But I guess that, that, that one hour stuff is more of the teaching side, mm. whereas the more, the bigger business is in a long-term partnership and um, consulting work with people. I got you. YouTube is just a beast. I'm addicted. I like, that's mainly what goes on my TV. We don't, we have a TV. It's mainly just to watch sports at the weekend, but generally it's either Netflix, Amazon Prime or YouTube. Probably in the reverse order, YouTube starting first. What, how long, how'd you get into this? I guess, because I think most younger listeners listening will go, yeah, that's the dream career. Like that YouTuber is now like the, the career <laughs> for so many young, young creators and young people in school. But how did you get into it? Because I mean, 10 years ago in YouTube terms is a long time. Yeah. Yeah. And, and really, I think when I think about it, it was actually 2000 and 2007. So that's, that's longer than 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> it's like 14 years. Um, so yeah, it was, it was a very long time ago. 
Um, and I guess I was kind of lucky. Like I was, I was, you know, I'm, I'm 25 now. I was born in 1996. So in 2007, I was 11. And I was always just really interested in technology and the internet. I remember like, even at the age of like, probably like seven or eight, I think I got my first camera and I was just, I was just really into shooting videos with me and my brother and just putting them on a computer and like making these like crazy montages of us like, you know, sparring or wrestling or <laughs> playing football. And we, we never uploaded them anywhere. We just, just like used to just have them on the computer and just watch with friends or whatever. And it was just a, a great little uh, thing we used to do. Um, and then I just discovered YouTube because YouTube was founded in 2005. It started to become like kind of a thing in like 2006. And I just found YouTube. I just loved how homemade everything felt, the DIY nature of it. Because, you know, you watch TV and you, you might love TV, but then you're like, I want to make TV. And then you realize you have to go to school to do it. You have to have all this expensive equipment. You need to have like actors and all this sort of stuff. You look at YouTube and you're like, wow, I could do this right now if I've got a camera. So I saw YouTube and I was like, wow, there's something I can do here. So I started uploading those videos I was making and to a channel. And I quickly kind of realized it wasn't actually the filming I was really interested in. It was the growing. It was building okay. an audience. It was cultivating an audience. Um, so even back then, I was 11 or 12. Um, I might be getting some of the, the ages mixed up, but it's roughly around 11 or 12. Mm. And I was looking at, okay, how are these channels growing? How can I apply that to me? I was thinking of every growth hack in the book. Back then, like things like sub for sub were, were like a big thing. So I figured out a strategy to like rank first on channel comments, which are an old feature where you used to be able to go into like a channel like Smosh and you could leave a comment. And if you got enough upvotes, it would be like at the top. And like, I would like, like kind of construct this comment that would get upvotes, but also would have like a subscriber sub to sub thing at the end. And I get loads of sub to subs from that. Terrible strategy now. I mean, it was a terrible strategy back then too, but it kind of was this, this idea of like, wow, I can actually get just random people in the world to see a comment and then go and watch my content. And the funny thing now is like doing that would be the worst thing possible because you're going to be bringing in people who probably don't have any interest in your videos, which actually might hurt your channel. But back then, YouTube's algorithm was much more simplistic. It was just like, people are watching, let's show it to more people. You know, it's kind of, it was, it was the, the simplest form of the algorithm. Um, and from there, I just kept making channels. Like between my teenage years, I kept it all quite private as well. I, I wasn't like, you know, I had lots of friends in school, but I wouldn't really mention it. I don't think any of my friends really knew about any of the channels. Um, what kind of stuff them, were you making? So like, like my first channel was just like a personal sort of skit channel where me and my brother used to just post like random skits. And it was mainly, it was mainly me and my brother was just, you know, um, an actor in the videos. Like I, I remember I threw up, like I put up a, a video where I, it was like a combination of throwing snowballs at my brother's face and putting them in slow-mo and like putting like dramatic music over them. Um, and I remember that video got, got like 10 views and two dislikes, <laughs> uh, one, one, like two dislikes and 10 views. And that's kind of where it started. And then over time, like whatever interest I had, whatever passion I have, and you know, we've all been a, you know, 12, 13, 14 year old kid. You just go through so many fads and phases. That's the, the time in your life. You just get into so much stuff. So like I had a channel where I, I talked about football. I think it was called Paddy G talks football. They're all, like, I think it's private now. I don't think it's available, <laughs> but anyone's going to try and look it up. Everyone's good on it right now. <laughs> yeah. Um, I had like, so I was into, I was really into music and EDM and electronic music. So I had, I had these channels where I used to essentially like have lots of artists that I knew that were making electronic music. And I built like a no copyright music um, channel. And I grew that to like a few thousand subscribers. Um, and, you know, I think I got like, you know, maybe a few hundred thousand views. And I started to like, oh, this is actually something, you know, I could do. It's interesting. Mm. Funny thing is back then, only the real top creators were monetizing. I wasn't monetizing. Um, but then over time, I started more channels. I had some success. I actually started a channel in 2014 um, where I posted Irish hip hop um, because I saw like lots of, there was lots of Irish hip hop artists and some of them are pretty good, but they were all just uploading like terrible videos with like no thumbnail and like a, you know, a misspelled title or something. Mm. And I was looking at that. I was like, wow, imagine there was like a hub where we could just post Irish hip hop. And I started that channel. Um, and that was probably the first successful channel I had um, to any scale anyway it was the first channel i had that really took off and like within a few years i grew that to 100k subs wow. 50 million views or something um at the start i didn't really make much money from it because um just posting i was just posting videos essentially and um, but after a while i built a kind of business model around it when i was in my my late teens um where i'd like you know do promotion for artists and like when they had a single launch we'd do a whole campaign together with their youtube channel 
Um, and you know, through that money, like that, that's how I lived. I didn't need a part-time job. Wow. I never, I never had a part-time job. I just, I just worked on YouTube and used that to help pay for college and everything else. Was that um, the first time you thought mm, might be a business here? Yeah. Yeah. That was it. Um, like I, I was always really interested to see how these YouTubers were monetizing. Um, but even like, even in 20, 2013, 2014, when I first started being able to do that myself, it wasn't, there wasn't much information about it. It was just like, oh, they get to turn ads on their channel and they get, they get money. But like, no one knew how much it was. And okay. it was, like, long story short, it wasn't very much back then, like compared to what, what it is now, it was just minuscule. Um, but yeah, I was like, there, there could be like an interesting business to build here. And the, the older I got, I just realized this is a skill. Like being able to build and monetize mm -hmm. as an audience is a skill. Um, and now, you know, long story short, I've, I had lots of other chances between the ages of 17 and, and 25 that we won't even go over to so many, but like my current channel now is, is almost like an accumulation of everything I've learned. I'm just trying to apply it through the videos. That's exactly like every entrepreneur. I think nearly everyone we've had on the pod so far, it, it, it's never the first one, right? It's like, you keep trying and trying and trying, failing, learning, iterating. And a YouTube channel is exactly that, isn't it? It's, it's the, all these experiments where you kind of keep tweaking, 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 tweaking. And you're the perfect example of that, of someone who just started through passion, but then slowly started to tweak and find his formula. What you said there, being able to build and monetize an audience, being a skill, arguably, I think in 2021, that's probably one of the best skills in marketing and the most in demand. Yeah, yeah, it's it's huge. I think I think the, um, the pandemic accelerated things as well. Um, I noticed that like even in like I follow lots of trends and data and like seeing like you know uh, Google Trends for like how to start a YouTube channel stuff like that how to grow an audience how to grow an Instagram all these different things just you know skyrocketed during um, the first lockdown but it was it was cultivating for years before that um, I'd say since about 2015 and 2016 like the whole online space YouTube platforms they've just been in this huge trajectory where every year more and more budget is taken away from your BBCs, your Foxes, mm -hmm. your CNNs, your RTEs, and is allocated towards digital marketing. And and even in digital marketing, I think the the trends I'm seeing is even more on YouTube than, than other platforms because of, of how engaged the audience is. So yeah, like I'm very lucky to in some ways have stumbled across it. It's 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 not too dissimilar. Like I'm not I'm not as rich as if I'd done this, but it's not too dissimilar to someone like stumbling across cryptocurrency and like mm -hmm. 2011 like i mean i wish i wish that was me in some ways but um it's kind of a similar thing where like at the time it just feels like kind of indie and like almost a bit like a bit almost like anarchist it's like this is like against everything else like it's like i'm gonna do this myself it's like a new financial currency and like youtube is like a new you know platform for video it's like the new tv and now we've got to a point where you know cryptocurrency is is almost mainstream now and, and youtube is mainstream like mm. people like the kids are not watching tv as, as i'm sure i'm sure you're aware like and, and people my age and, and you yourself like like i watch about the only tv i watch is sport like i only watch mm -hmm. like the the boxing or the football yeah um yeah i watch a bit of netflix but even netflix in itself netflix is more like youtube than it is traditional media in some ways like it's it's a yeah. platform um you know they've, they've got algorithms they 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 have like a thumbnail algorithm that switches thumbnails based on what thumbnails you clicked in the past so if you prove to netflix that you're interested in um like relationships and couples there might be a movie where even the relationship of a couple isn't a big theme. They'll show you a picture with a relationship like two people kissing in the thumbnail. Oh wow! So, like, is that things, that's dynamic? Is it? Yeah, that's dynamic. It changes oh, based on your wow. your behavior. And there's actually a really good thread on Twitter. I was reading about it recently, um, and I think that lends itself more to YouTube and the way YouTube creators think mm. about content than it does traditional um, media. But the rise of I won't call them celebrity YouTubers, but people who have built massive followings in an immensely short space of time, relatively speaking, you know, a couple of years. Um, it's phenomenal. People, one, two, three million subs who've only maybe started in the last three, four years. It's it's phenomenal. Do you put that down to kind of the the growth in YouTube over the last kind of couple of years? Yeah, it's 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 down to a number of things. Like it is like, yes, yeah, the popularity, it's the new users coming to, to YouTube. But a lot of it is cultivated by by YouTube's algorithm and the way they view content distribution. So like, you know, in in Hollywood, I'm not going to say this as a complete you know blanket statement, but like in general, it's like you know it's who you know. It's like getting your lucky break. It's like working away and like there's plenty of amazing actors who you you'll never heard of because maybe they just didn't know the right person. Maybe they didn't have the perfect smile or whatever. YouTube's algorithm is is a meritocracy. 
if you make a video that has better metrics and is, is more entertaining and more interesting than a channel with 10 million subs, you will get more views. Like if you can do that, it's, it's easy, it's easy to say than done, but that's why you see that these sudden rises. And every time you look at the person who, who had this big blow up, whether it's, you know, even, you know, people that are maybe a bit more controversial, like even like the Paul brothers, they were providing something different than new Casey Neistat. He was, you know, making incredibly good content in 2017 that, you know, I feel like everyone who loves YouTube was watching. Um, Beast, Mr. Beast, like he it's a, it essentially invented a genre of YouTube. Like he makes videos that are kind of in a category of their own. Mm -hmm. And if you erased Mr. Beast's name from history and erased his success and everyone who knew who he was and he started again now and he started making videos of the same quality, he'd be right back up there again. And that's why YouTube's algorithm, in my opinion, is so is it's so interesting and so fair. It's no one's saying it's easy. Like it's it's difficult. And like at the end of the day, like you're competing against people who maybe have more experience, more money, more budgets. But I still say like if you go into film or music, you could be a great band or a great rapper or a great um actor. And there's so many like constructs getting in your way. If you're on YouTube, if you if you go into a niche and you make content better than anyone else in the niche, you will blow up. And, and that's why you see so many channels really succeed. It's really, really interesting. And is that driven purely by the algorithm, Paddy? Well, I mean, the algorithm is, is, is driven by the audience. So like the, it's the audience's preference. If the audience preferred, you know, like big celebrity names, that's what would be shown. So the algorithm follows the audience. Like if the audience proved that they like kind of individual careers, as opposed to say someone like, let's say someone like Will Smith, they can come to YouTube and pull mm -hmm. some views. But realistically, there's like YouTubers in their bedrooms pulling like three times the viewership. And that's because the YouTube audience prefers that authentic feel yeah. and you know the actual people they can relate to and, and get on with so yeah it's it's like it's 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 sort of the audience wants that so youtube cultivates that um uh, but there is there is obviously some side of things where because it's a you know at the end of the day, it's an algorithm and it's a recommendation system it's not going to look at who your dad was you know yeah. it's going to look at what are your numbers and what are the, the the matching audiences that we can recommend this content to it's the ultimate meritocracy as you say Casey yeah. Neistat, just go back to him for a second. My God, we were addicted to him, me and my wife. Every day, that was what we did at dinner. Sat down, watched Casey's daily vlog. For anyone not familiar with Casey, he daily vlogged for how long, Paddy? I think it was like two and a half or three years. Yeah, Something every crazy. day produced a daily vlog, 10 minutes. Just the highest quality stuff, narrative, story driven. It could be about absolutely nothing. And you would sit down and be entertained for 10 minutes. Like, it's just, if you haven't watched it, go back, go check him out after the pod. Phenomenal stuff. Like, and he was, he was a very interesting case in the fact that he had started in traditional media and then crossed over. Yeah, yeah. And if you, if you kind of look at what he did in traditional media, though, it's funny. Some of that stuff, it actually feels like kind of this, the sort of stuff that, that blew up in the early days of YouTube. Mm -hmm. So he, he did that, like, Vlogbrothers thing yeah. with his brother, I think. And if you look at it, it's homemade DIY stuff. And that was working in like 2003, 2004. Um, so that I guess there was almost like a, a, maybe a bit of, maybe he'd figured out something. Maybe there was a bit of a feeling around um, the content he was making that there was something here. He just needed the platform. And yeah, he took a bit of time. Like he did do a lot of traditional media stuff. And then when he went daily, you know, I mean, he was doing that at a time where daily content was just very popular. It was the trend. Mm. Um, everything was pointing towards that trend. And he just crushed it. He made great videos every single day. And I can't tell you, and I'm sure you know yourself, but like any YouTuber you're seeing right now on your screen, I would say the vast majority were, were Casey fans. Like I'm, I'm oh, a Casey yeah. fan, like, you know, and you know, there's like, there's a like Casey super fans and then there's like Casey fans. I wouldn't, I wouldn't call myself a super fan, but I watched every video. So maybe I am. <laughs> um, <laughs> and you know, just, just incredible content. So simple. Like, it was, you know, you could you could be sitting down on your couch and you could see he uploaded and then you could see that RT are coming out with a new show that, you know, they had like a, a three million euro budget for. They've got like these big actors. Mm. You're picking the Casey Nice that video and it's Always. just a guy going around with a drone or something in New York on a skateboard. It's just it just sums up why YouTube is popular. I think. The relationship side of YouTube is fascinating. Yeah. You build relationships with these creators like you build a relationship with Casey. You feel like you're part of his life. It's so intimate. And like you said, it's it's um not amateur, but it's it's raw. 
you know, it's, it's, it's very unpolished. You feel like you're getting an insight into his life as opposed to when you watch TV, you know, it's been scripted and you know, it's, it's all quite fake. But when with him, you just feel like you're having this insight into how he lives his life. Yeah, that, that's the thing. That is, that is the thing. That's that's the differentiator. That's the competitive advantage, I, I feel. And sure, like, you know, there's a, there's a million channels on YouTube. That are like, you know, there's millions of channels on YouTube. And some of them aren't relationship-based at all. Some of them are, like, purely educational or whatever. But at its essence, so much of the, like, the big entertainment channels is the fact that you actually feel part of that journey. Um, You know, when you, when you watch a, a TV show, you can kind of, like, like and there is loads of great TV shows and I love I just I, I love traditional media and TV as well like I love I love a good movie more than as much as the next man I love a good TV show as well, um but you never like you feel kind of connected to them in that moment, but when you're really into a YouTuber, it it sounds almost cringy to say but it is like having a friend through a screen and it is having it's someone that you can relate to it's someone that in some in some ways like can shape your your kind of worldview and like I've I've like there's there's a YouTuber I watch um. He's called Joe Delaney, and he's a fitness YouTuber. I watch him um, as well. Yeah, fast yeah. man, dude. Fast and man. deep dude. Like yeah, yeah. I, I watched a lot of his videos when I was like, I would say, kind of like 18, 19, 20, um, like a, maybe four or five years ago. Um, and I think back to it all the time. But I'm like, those videos actually like have shaped a lot of my perspective on things. Mm. And I'm sure if he was listening to this, he'd probably be like, "Oh no, what have I done?" <laughs> but like, you know, he, he was a, he was a smart guy. He wasn't any, any you know, he's not like you know, a philosopher or anything, but he was a smart guy and he, he had like good morals and a good outlook on life. And I feel like I've applied that. Whereas, you know, I could, I could watch a movie that's breaking down, like, you know, some great philosopher and stuff. And sure, I could kind of learn from it. And, you know, I've read lots of books and learned from them, but there's something to be said from just like learning from a friend. You know, it feels like the most influential people on you are the people you feel closest to. So it makes sense why YouTubers have a both positive and negative influence over people and largely positive in, um, which is lucky to say yeah that's a good point actually it is a generally a positive place as opposed to a lot of other social media why do you think that is um like i mean i mean there's, there's kind of two sides to it where like it depends so like i guess saying it's largely positive might be too a bit too far because there is like if you don't go to the comment section if you don't yeah, scroll yeah. down too far in the yeah. comment section if you watch the video yeah. in the first two or three comments it's positive <laughs> exactly i think it's just so much easier to be a passerby with twitter or instagram because you could see a piece of content um you know on your on your twitter and you might not have any relationship with that person you're not gonna invest any time into them but if you disagree with it you could just like this is you know this is useless or this is rubbish like i'm not saying we would but like you know you're your typical internet troll whereas on youtube i guess it requires a bit more commitment you have to go onto the platform watch a video before you like you know <laughs> spout your hate um but you know i guess there's plenty of like sides of youtube they can get very toxic like the whole sort of like entertainment and then commentary channels a lot of that got quite toxic um mm. but you know maybe, maybe people like me and you we watch a lot of people like you know kind of like the graham stephens the people like that and you, you don't really think of those people getting much hate and i'm sure they do get some but yeah. like it's it's nothing compared to let's say you know an instagram model who gets thousands of comments a day saying she looks slightly overweight today or something you know um, I guess it's, it's the reason the audience is there and primarily on YouTube, if you're watching videos, it's because you like that creator and, mm. and discovery on YouTube is pretty good as well to the point where I look at my Twitter feed even today and I, I still get like shown tweets that annoy me and that can only be really intentional. They're getting engagement. It has to whereas, be a purpose. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. Whereas YouTube and, and the same with Facebook, like Facebook cultivate, at least they, I think they've changed their algorithm slightly more, um, in the last two years, but for a very long period of time, they cultivated engage, like they, they wanted engagement no matter what. So like they show people things that they disagree with because it got more engagement and it kept them arguing on the platform. Whereas YouTube really put focus on viewer satisfaction. So how much people are actually enjoying the content and, and like they, they have ways, they have like data sets to like to actually measure that and to try to figure out, okay, did someone actually enjoy this video or not? So in general, if you're on your YouTube uh, recommended page, you're going to get recommended videos that there's a, a high chance you're going to like. Whereas on Twitter, you can go through and you're like, I really disagree with that. I hate yeah. that. And it's, it's just trying to provoke a reaction. So maybe there's like a deeper um, consequence of that, that that we see reflected. In I think you're right. They're, they're geared up for different things, right? It's exactly like you just broke down there. Twitter and Facebook are geared up to get engagement above all else. Whereas YouTube is, is geared up to get you watching and get you yeah. enjoying. It's, it's geared up so you kind of go, oh, great. Patty's got a new video or oh, great. You know, Max Tuning's got a new video. Great, I love that. You know, and then just 
you go into the thing, you spend longer, you spend longer watching ads. They both do the same means, but they're very, very different ways of approaching it. Bring me back. I've fallen into the YouTube love session already. Bring me back to how you started, though, because you said you had the Irish channel first, the Irish music channel first. What was your... We, did you go to college or did you jump straight into it? Well, what was and when you left school? What happened? What you do? Yeah, so like that was that was the first successful channel. Um, I had uh, you know I'd say between the ages of eleven and and that age, which was sixteen or seventeen, I probably started forty channels. Like wow. I tried to count it one day, and I I tell people I I have had thirty channels, but I'm pretty sure it's probably closer to like fifty. Because I have so many email accounts, and like I found the notebook recently from when I was uh, <laughs> all your passwords was, written down, good security. <laughs> yeah, yeah, when I was a young fella, and it was like there was a date on it, it was like 2012 or something, and it was like just this list of passwords for all these different ideas. Because I'm an ideas person, so whenever I think it'd be great to do, I was into calisthenics, for example, like mm. like you know pull ups and stuff like that. And I was like, it'd be great to do a channel on calisthenics. I guarantee you get loads of views. So I started a channel, did like two videos, I gave up, and did another channel, and it's, you know made two videos. It just completely followed my passion. I didn't really stick to anything. So like the Irish, yeah, the Irish uh, music channel, which is called RMTV, if anyone wants to look it up. Um, you know, the, the content was amazing. I, d- I made a lot of mistakes with it. I didn't do everything right, but it was the first thing that actually got real traction um, to the point where, I mean, uh, like it's got like 120K subs now, which to oh, wow, it's still going. some, to, yeah, to some, uh, like it's, it's, it is discontinued, but it is still growing. Mm. Um, but to some people would look like, you know, sometimes with the amounts of views we see and stuff nowadays, it seems like a small number, but in terms of the, the niche I was addressing, Irish hip hop, like it's a lot of people and it was a lot of people back then. I remember just seeing the view counts and being like, wow, like I had no idea the audience was this big for this content. Um, and I don't think anyone did. Um, but yeah, I, I, I did. I started that when I was in like fifth or fifth year in school, perhaps fifth or sixth year in school. Um, but I'll be honest, like I, I definitely had a business mind, but I didn't. I'm not one of those like prodigies that are suddenly like at 16, 17, like, wow, I can just go full, full into this. And I, Cause I think even back then, like 2013, 2014, it wasn't as accepted. It wasn't even as known. So like right now, if you're, if you're like a, a 17 year old kid and you're, you're coming to your leaving sir and someone asks you what you're doing, absolutely saying, I'm going to continue my YouTube channel. And you've got like 50 K subscribers. They're like, sounds like a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas like, you know, I, I might have had like double that, but if I told people, you know, I'm going to do this YouTube channel, they would have been like, are you crazy? So I went to, I went to college and um, I went to DCU, studied a really good program at DCU mix of like business marketing technology, uh, bachelor of science, uh, which was, you know, a lot of it doesn't really apply to what I do now, to be honest, like, like most colleges, but it was more about just giving myself some breathing room in life as well, mm. because the idea of just rushing straight into a channel, sure, it's attractive when you think about it, but then you kind of miss out on some things. And, um, you know, that kind of whole college experience, I was like, yeah, I might as well go. And I was really, I'm really glad I did go actually. Um, so I went to college um, in college, I had a placement. I worked in a marketing agency in, in Dublin for um, a year, just over a year. Um, had an interesting time there. I learned a lot about, you know, everything from management. So I had a team that was working with me um, to, you know, content creation, to digital marketing, to strategy, even to like how to like stick to deadlines and stuff. That mm. taught me a lot. Um, and then after that finished, so that was, that placement lasted a year. After that finished, I I got my last paycheck for that job. And the the Irish music channel had, had declined quite um, considerably because in 2017, YouTube revenue was just obliterated because of a few controversies, the adpocalypse, they called it. Um, and that really affected um, content that had profanity in it. So I was able to monetize oh, the videos okay. I shot myself on that channel, which I went around and filmed with with different artists. And I like, you know, I, I, I drove to Sligo, I filmed loads of videos, I drove to Mayo, I'd done these road trips where I filmed videos and suddenly like, you know, the videos might have made me like a few hundred quid or maybe even a thousand quid. And now suddenly they're, you know, making me peanuts, like, you know, okay. five quid a video. And it took me like a day to film it. <laughs> so I was like, wow, you know, I still had the other side of the business, which was like the, you know, promoting a single or something, but like, it wasn't that sustainable. It wasn't a big, you know, art, like in general, like music artists aren't the people with the biggest budgets. And, you know, you always want to make sure you really deliver value for them as well, because everyone relates to that position of trying to get something out there, at least you do as a creative person. Um, so it was, it was a difficult thing to monetize. And that was kind of, I guess, failing in a way. Uh, I'd finished that job and I remember just feeling a bit like, hmm, like I don't really have anything 
that I'm doing right now. I don't have like a project or anything. And then I remember this, this Paddy Galloway channel, which is the channel that people know me, uh, me from now, which I'd actually started two years earlier. Um, and I'd, I'd made a few videos on that channel. I'd done e extremely well. Like my first, my first like YouTube breakdown video. I remember I spent probably about a week making that video. I spent so much time making it and I only made it because I actually wrote the script for myself to learn myself about the YouTuber to like understand how he grew. Okay. I didn't write it for a video. Who was it? Like, Peter McKinnon. Oh um, yes. The photographer yeah, guy. Class. And cause he grew, he grew to a million subscribers in one year and um, in a very competitive niche. So I was like, okay, what if I convert this to a video, convert it to a video, upload it to a channel that I already had, which at the time was called facts tube. Um, which is now my current channel. It had a few videos on there about like facts about YouTubers, like how much, um, KSI makes. And I had like some million view videos on there that had, you know, quite decent momentum, but I uploaded this video in September, 2017, the Peter McKinnon one. And I was kind of excited about it, but I was also like, I don't know how this is going to do. I uploaded it and I got like 60 views in like the first day, which was like terrible for this channel. Like in general, you should get like 500 or a thousand. I got like 60 views and like dislikes and people were like, what is this? Um, and I was like, at the time I was like, maybe this YouTube channel isn't for me. Like maybe I should just, you know, focus on college and whatever else. Um, and then like, I remember someone messaged me saying, I, I watched your Peter McKinnon video. It was really good, a friend, like, and I was like, how did you find that? And he was like, it just got recommended to me and I, I watched it. And I logged back into YouTube studio and the video had like 300,000 views. Wow. And I was like, wow, this, you know, this is cool. So I made, I made a video on Casey Neistat then, which again, got like 600,000 views or something. Um, and then I made another video after that. And I think one more after that, and they didn't do quite as well, but they still got a lot of views, but I just left the channel completely dormant after that, because I just didn't see the, the bigger picture at the time. And I also, I don't think I was fully as committed or as passionate to YouTube at that particular time in my life because of some of the stuff that had gone on with the Irish hip hop channel. And like, I was just like, oh, YouTube's like too risky. Um, but after the job finished, after the, the Irish channel was really, Irish uh, rap channel was really declining. I was like, hmm. That channel's still there. It's got like 30K subs. Maybe I could make something of this. Like maybe I could like, cause I know so much about YouTube and I've done this and people seem to really, really like the videos. Mm. Maybe I could make something really special of this. So I just started making videos. And that's, I channeled this kind of like feeling of not having anything cause I just didn't have a project. And by not having anything, I, I, I was okay. Like I didn't have much, but I was okay financially. I wasn't like in, in trouble or anything, but I just didn't have any like passion and whenever I don't have like something I'm working on I just feel like depressed I just like I don't have any energy I'm like what am I doing I need, I need to have something to work on which is why whenever I talk about like early retirement I just think actually that's probably a terrible idea because I, I just need to have something um I'm working on so I started posting these videos and they did pretty well like they got like 30k views so I was a channel like 30k subscribers and the videos were getting like 30 50k views um all the way up until Christmas 2019 when I uploaded a video on Mr Beast and at the time I had 40 K subs upload that video. And to this day, it's, it's the most viral video. It's not the most viewed video I've ever made on any channel, but it's the most viral video as in it got the most amount of views in a short amount of time. Um, I uploaded that on December the 17th, 2019 took, took a couple of days to start getting recommended. Then it picked up a little bit. And I remember I woke up on the 23rd, um, of December and it had like 40k views in, in a week. I was like, wow, this, this is a good performing video. And I had like a comment from my friend, uh, my, my friend, Nate O'Brien, who makes finance videos. Uh, you might've seen him before. Yeah. And he was like, this is a great video. It's going to get a million views. Hmm. And I was like, ah, oh. like imagine. And then because of Christmas, there's a few other things going on. I just sort of left it and I checked it back again that evening and it shot up to hundred K views. And then on the 24th in one day, it got like 600,000 views. On the 25th, it got like 600,000 views. Wow. So my real time on YouTube, I'd gone from like, you know, a few thousand views every 48 hours to like 1.4 million. And I was like, oh my God. What a Christmas. And <laughs> yeah. And like the video, like my, I, I had actually said at the end of the video, I've set a goal this year to hit 50K subs. I don't think it's going to happen, but if you're watching this video, just subscribe. That video alone brought in 50K subs wow. in like a month. So that really took off. And from there, I was like, I looked at the comments and I was like, in, the, inside of me, I was kind of thinking, is this luck? Like, did I just get lucky with, did I just hit, hit the lorry? But when I looked at the comments, I was like, these videos are actually really helpful and no one else is doing them. Um, and some people th think it might be, oh, you're, you're just covering a big YouTuber. Like that's, that's why you're getting views. But I'd always show them like, 
look at all these other videos where people covered like the YouTuber and other and other like situations of like, you know, like how much money does this YouTuber make or how did this YouTuber do this or whatever. But my angle was a bit different. I think it was it was coming out from a new angle that a lot of other people hadn't seen before, and I was like, okay, maybe maybe this isn't luck. Maybe there's a career here. And essentially, since then, so 2020 and 2021, I've just been pushing out videos and growing month over month. Um, so now December 2019, I was on 40k before the Mr. Beast video, and now I'm on to 70k, I think. Um, and you know, I, I I see a lot of potential to keep growing it and. Um, I'm very blessed and I still think it's a bit of luck, but obviously I, I hit the right everything thing is, on the buddy. right head. Everything is luck. Yeah. <laughs> the older you get, you realize the more luck and you be honest, you're more honest than most people would be because most people don't recognize the importance that luck played in their journey. So yeah, luck is, luck is phenomenal to anyone who's listened to this for the first time and hasn't heard previous episodes we've done with creators like Rob or people like that. How does a YouTuber make money? Yeah, so the the easiest way a YouTuber makes money is after they get a thousand subs and four thousand watch hours, which are like amount of hours people watch the content. You can just turn on the button that puts ads at the start of your video, and if the video is over eight minutes, you can put ads in the middle of your video, and you can put ads at the end of the video. And essentially, anytime someone clicks on a video, if they see an ad, it registers, and you get a tiny percentage of that. Um, I mean, it's it's not a tiny percentage; it's it's fifty five percent, and you should get forty five percent. Um, but like every, every view counts for like a tiny amount. It's like, a, you know, 0.01 of a cent. Um, but when that adds up and you're getting a few thousand views of a video or whatever, you can, you can start to make a, a decent amount of money from, from AdSense. I would say like in most niches, you need like probably like a million views a month to make considerable uh, money with AdSense, like enough to pay for a living depending on your niche. Mm. But there's some niches, like for example, like my niche is quite good for ad revenue and there's other niches like finance where advertisers will really want to pay a lot of money for your ads because it's a it's a, a niche with lots of money around it, like finances, like banks and like lawyers and like all these things that, that would want to attract the right audience. So they're willing to pay a lot more. It's like, you know, like someone who's um, sponsoring the Formula One might pay a lot more than someone who's sponsoring like League Two football because the average Formula One fan, at least the, the notion is they're, they're wealthy and they're really into, you know, cars and Rolexes and, you know, stuff like that. Um, and the same thing kind of applies with YouTube. It, it varies so much on niche. So depending on your niche, you get like a essentially an RPM, which is how much you get paid per 1,000 views. Typically, it'd be kind of anywhere between like two and like five dollars for most channels. But the the more niche and the more focused on like an older audience with money, so like finance, golf, fishing, like any channels that have like an audience that's let's say 25 to 35, and they actually have budget to spend, um, they'll typically get a lot higher. I've seen up to like 20 30 40 dollars so to put that out the context if you get it if you make a video with a million views you're gonna make 40 grand so when you put it like that you're like oh wow like that is i think that's know, the line just just hooked in all the listeners yeah. they're like wait what did he say <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah so there's money to be made obviously in in youtube for anyone's completely not in the space at all it is a lucrative business if you have the right space if you have the right niche and the right set of skills yeah yeah there, there is there is it's competitive but the thing is, you don't necessarily need the like people think about YouTube and still to this day that the kind of preconceived notion about YouTube is you make YouTube videos. OK, you're a crazy guy that runs around with a camera, mm. but there are like hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of YouTube channels that are making six, seven, eight figures without even appearing on camera. There's channels that make money just reviewing tech. There's channels that make money just, you know, writing film reviews or whatever. And you don't always need the big views. Like you can make a, a decent living on YouTube with like five, 10,000 views a video if you monetize in other ways, because I've mentioned AdSense, but you know, it's an audience. You can use affiliate marketing. You can send people to a product and get a commission. You could do sponsorships. Like when you get to kind of 10 K views a video, you'll start to get brands reaching out to sponsor content. They might give you like a thousand quid to mention, you know, their products in your video for 10 seconds or for 60 seconds or whatever. So really the, the kind of further you get the bigger the audience you build or the more focus your audience gets around a certain topic the more opportunities you have to monetize and then there's also like the you know creator products like you could launch your own course you could launch your own merch line you could you know there's, there's infinite things you can kind of leverage the audience to do um but it all comes back to the content if you can make content that even like a few thousand people watch there's a business there if you can make content that make 
you know that you get a few hundred thousand people watching depending on your niche there's a multi-million um euro business there mm. and you touched on it there in terms of creators using their audience for their own products i was watching a max tuning video last night and he was talking about his, his business um sour candy uh sour strips and he launched it two years ago and he kind of said in a kind of throwaway comment he goes yeah and this year we'll we'll probably do eight figures and i had to like get my fingers out and count out how many that was that is incredible two yeah. years eight figures in turnover and he he's he's a big youtuber but he like i would say i, I can't remember because I, I watched him a while ago but i would say he's got like three or four hundred k subscribers 350 i think so somewhere in the middle somewhere around yeah. that so like big but not like astronomical big um exactly. but he has such a passionate when you look at his viewer count and then you look at the videos he's getting per video it's quite high and obviously they're engaged and they're actually driving it now he, he's he's a smart dude right he kind of plays it up a bit that he isn't but he's he's clearly a smart guy he's in target he's in walmart he's he's gone directly into retail as well so he's not just you know click the link to buy some candy off me he's really leveraged it but it comes back to what you're saying the power of leveraging an audience is astronomical i think a lot of people haven't woken up to that yet social media has gobbled up a lot of ad spend over the last like five six years but you can slowly see it turn into long form content and youtube in particular yeah and, and i think <laughs> if i was to sell youtube to a brand for example you can you can like you know pay for a sponsor post on instagram or something and you know, I've, I've got an Instagram page um, that's got like a 160K followers. So I've got like a good idea of like how many, how much people are offered or how much opportunities there is there. And I think a lot of brands are wake, wake, woken up to the fact that in general on like Instagram and TikTok, they can be good for like product placements and like mm. specific things. So like if you're like a, a restaurant or like a hotel chain, like, you know, it makes sense. But for a lot of other products, especially when they're more niche, if you can find a YouTuber, that's got like 100k views a video and has a really targeted audience their viewers aren't just what like you know casually watching them they're super engaged and in tune mm -hmm. there are there are exceptions to this but the general like instagram influencer for, per se which i respect anyone that puts themselves out there it's, it's no shade at all but the average instagram influencer if you if you go and like find their like core fans and say like you know how engaged are you with them they're kind of like oh they post good pictures i like them or you know oh they post like funny videos it's it's, it's funny or whatever but if you find like the core following of like you know casey neistat it's like he's a huge part of my life yeah. it's kind of rare you'd get that in like you know an instagram influencer you, you you wouldn't get like someone saying they're like a huge part of my life you know you know obviously there's exceptions but in general and that's where the value is because i know like even even to, um, with my channel to a certain extent I know that I've, if I endorse something, there's, you know, at least a few thousand people that are going to go check it out mm -hmm. and they're going to go say, oh, what's this all about? Patty says it's good. And that's why I like the, the kind of um, the responsibility comes with that power of being like, OK, I can't just take money from anyone. Like I've, I've been offered mind boggling amounts of money from just ridiculous companies that make no sense and would just i remember you i love your budget. q and a's i love your q and a's you put up on instagram because they're like they're a gem of information so anyone go go follow patty on instagram and youtube but definitely check out his q and a's on instagram because you put up so much good information you posted up some mad stories about stuff you were offered and money you were offered for for shout outs and instagram posts yeah yeah i mean the reality is you, you, like uh, like when you're in a, a good audience like me uh, like i am or a good niche like i am and you're you're very focused on an engaged audience and you get good views per video so if you're for example if you're a brand and you're looking for if you've got like a, a youtube product or if you've got it doesn't have to be a youtube product if you're just like a, a camera producer or maybe you're like um a royalty free music library all these things that are kind of relatable to anyone who makes content and you're looking for a creator who makes videos for youtubers I'm lucky enough to say that there's not that many other channels that get my level of views. There's maybe like me and like maybe one or two other channels in the whole of the world that gets the level of views I have for my niche. So if you're a business, you know, it's like the top of the pile that this is the people who have, have the biggest audiences or gets the most views per video, which again, like com completely lucky to have. And maybe that won't always be the case, but at least it is for now. Um, so they're willing to spend a lot of money. They're willing to spend a lot of money. Um, and like maybe the typical brand deal that, um, someone with the entertainment channel gets 
they might get more views per video, but they might get less in the brand deal because there's like an infinite amount of other channels they could mm -hmm. go to. And it becomes like a bidding war of like, oh, you know, I'll do it for four grand. Oh, I'll do it for three and a half. Whereas, you know, in my case, there's, there's not that many people that have that, that audience in this niche. It's 50 so, grand lads or hit the road. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I, I can negotiate, I can negotiate big deals. And, you know, on top of that, yeah, like, like you said, like I, I say on my story, sometimes I'll get people, you know, who'll be like, you know, post one video and we'll give you 15 grand just to promote this app. And I go look at the app and it's, it's useless or it's just, it's trying to be the new Photoshop or it's, you know, it's trying to be the new Premiere Pro and it's just, it's got terrible user interface. And it's clear that maybe that, you know, maybe they're a Chinese company, maybe they're like a big Silicon Valley startup with like a lot of investor money. It doesn't matter to me if, if it's not good, I am not promoting it. I don't mm -hmm. care if they pay me 20, 30, 40 grand. I mean, you know, everyone likes to say that, but like if someone gave me off me a hundred grand, you know, <laughs> I'd have to like really consider my life choices and morals. Um, not trying to put myself out there. Like I, I, I don't want the temptation, but I think, I think there's something in that, like being able to, to say no. Um, yeah. And you know, there is like a lot of people sort of, this is like a, a bit of a, a more, um, I guess almost like introspective point, but a lot of people say, Oh, like I only take the brand deals that I want to work with, but that comes from a place of privilege in some ways. So like maybe I'm a privileged channel right now that I have a lot of opportunities, whereas maybe like a smaller entertainment channel, maybe even a bigger entertainment channel that doesn't have the best RPMs, they need the money to pay their team. So sometimes they have to like, I, I never can justify like promoting something terrible, but sometimes they have to like push that boundary a little bit and say like, Raid Shadow Legends, come on in. Let's <laughs> let's get let's get going. Like 10 grand, put it down and the video's out. There we go, take it off. But the thing is with a YouTuber, you are your brand. You are- yeah. Paddy Galloway is the brand. You are the name. You are, your name is over the door. You're the face of it. So for you to put something, your your name to that is, it means a lot, I think. Um, talk to me about your other business, the consulting business, because that's fascinating in itself. You have two businesses parallel, very similar, but parallel. Talk to me about that. What what do you do? And you've worked with some massive names. So if you can, can maybe talk about what you've done with them as well, that'd be great. Yeah, so essentially, if you ever heard that phrase, like the best way to, to learn is to teach. Um, I, I think it's, it's so true. And like, you know, it, it is like a certain level of imposter syndrome comes with that because you're like, how can you teach something that you're still learning? I kind of always argue that you're, you should be always learning. Um, but with the channel, naturally, I was having to put a lot of research into channels. And then I was like, okay, a lot of people are watching. Damn, I better make sure I know what I'm talking about. I better be, you know, making sure I, I'm up to date on the latest trends. And then over time, I just started to really figure out stuff about YouTube. And like, I would, you know, put hours into my calendar every day where I'm just breaking down viral videos and seeing what the commonalities were. And I built like spreadsheets where I'd analyze video data and just constantly try to understand things. And this was all before I started consulting. So I got to the point where I'm like, wow, I am, you know, quite skilled at this. I can make videos with good information there. And then off the back of those videos, I'd always get people saying, hey, do you offer any consulting? And I'd say, no, not yet, because I was just waiting until I was felt like I was good enough to actually offer that. Okay. And then around June of last year, or May of last year, um, a guy reached out to me, um, is, is a good friend of mine now. And he was like, I'm looking to, to hire someone to come in. You seem to know your stuff. Would you be interested? And we start working together. Um, you know, it was, um, it was, it was well paid, but it wasn't, it wasn't crazy money or anything, but it was, it was a good opportunity to learn. Um, and I worked with him for about, I would say, 10 to 20 hours a month consulting where I just help him with thumbnails and titles. And because I was able to like use that foundation I had from my own channels and just from studying YouTube, I picked up things really quickly. Mm -hmm. So he was a Minecraft channel. I learned a Minecraft niche very quickly. I learned what worked and what didn't. And, you know, through my work, but through everyone else's work on the team, we put that channel from 20 million to, to basically like 50 or 60 million uh, views a month. Uh, by the time I left and, and as I said like it, it's never it wasn't it definitely wasn't just me like there was lots of other factors lots of other people working really hard on it but a lot of what we were applying was working and the approach we took and the way I I was like helping him train up new people and like every week we'd have a meeting where I'd pitch the latest data we're getting back from from our videos and we were learning from it each time we had this really nice feedback loop system um, and in, in simple terms if you if you take a channel from 20 million to 60 million views that's 3x revenue um mm. so i was like you know there's there's a bigger business here like there's there's something there's something more um that i can do here like i, I can build i can take on multiple clients like at the time i was just working with him and like a few other people 
a bit of a lesser basis um, all big channels but like on a lesser basis like a few hours a month instead of 10 or 20 hours a month um, and long story short like I started posting about it on Twitter because I had a bit of a following there anyway and I just started posting stuff like being like okay like you know I'm working on this channel now we just got 3 million views in the first 24 hours we got 6 million views on this video you know I just posted a few things here and there um, and then um, more people reached out started working with a few more people um, at one point, obviously, Mr. Beast uh, reached out. I chatted to him a few times before, just on, on Twitter, and we were on a call together, actually, um, a few months prior as well. And he was just like, you know, I see you're doing a lot of cool stuff. Um, I'd love you to come work with me. So, like, to cut a long story short, I uh, it was originally just kind of like, hey, it'd be cool if we work together, but let's kind of like, let's just talk it out over the next few weeks. And then he got me to do some work, and then he was like, okay, I want you now. <laughs> and right. We, we started to start doing some work together and it didn't it didn't turn into a long-term thing um because you know they primarily look for people that are very like all in on his channel because that's the kind of business he's building which is just incredible um so it, did, it didn't like cultivate into anything too long term but i worked with him for a few months and that was just incredible learning experience and some of the videos i worked on um i just look at them now and they've got like you know one of them has like 120 million views and I'm like it's, it's just ridiculous to think that a video that you know, I remember just just being worked on as like this little baby that had like lots of terrible moments and like you know, the, like the first cut was all rough. And I remember me, me and the editor were working together on it, and like we were like, oh wow, like this is such a mess. There's so many timelines, you know, and working it into this video that you know did it incredibly well. And, you know, again, just like with everything else, I played a very small part um, in the overall success of it, but it's still it's still a part, and it, it still helped uh, contribute to to the video success, and. Since then, I've been working with lots of big creators, people like Preston Plays, who's a channel in the United States, who's got a combined um, YouTube following of 50 million, um, gets about three, 400 million views a month um, from, his, from his channels. Um, I've worked with plenty of big 1 million plus channels. Most, most of the big like entertainment channels popping off right now, I've worked with people like Eric, uh, people like Zealus, people like Ryan Trey, and I've done calls with, um, and these are all guys, you know, pulling 50 million views a month, 20 million views a month, 100 million views a month. Um, and actually, just before this call, I was, uh, I had just been doing some work with the Infographics Show, uh, which is a big channel with 11 million subscribers that pulls like 100 million views a month. Wow. So it's been, it's been a phenomenal experience. And it, it just, it's just been this constant snowball effect from like doing, doing good work and then just constantly getting better and just getting results. Like none of this would happen if I didn't get results for people. And that's, that's the one thing I really pride myself in. Um, in the majority of cases, obviously there's exceptions. In the majority of cases, when I start working with a channel, we increase views. And that's essentially my job and my goal. What? We'll get a little bit of free consulting off you here, Paddy. If anyone wants to book consulting with Paddy, go just go to his YouTube channel or his Instagram or his Twitter. But when you, if, if you have people listening here, if we've YouTubers in our midst here listening, what, what general advice? I know it's very difficult to give advice when you can't see the channel. If someone's starting out on YouTube, right, that's probably an easier question. If someone's starting out, what are the core fundamentals they need to be looking at? Yeah, and, and that's the that's the key distinction because if it's a, you know, a channel with 20 million subscribers, yeah. I'm like looking at, you know, retention fall off at 30 seconds and comparing against the average and comparing multiple retention curves on the one chart and seeing these things and, you know, seeing how impressions change based on all these other factors and thumbnail switches. But for someone starting out, I mean, it's cliche advice, but the first thing is to do is, to do is just to make loads of videos and, and, and on plenty of channels. Like, you know, you can start lots of channels. Like your first channel probably isn't gonna be the one that takes off for you. And some people might say, oh, but it's about my personal brand. So like, that's my channel. I'm like, well, maybe the first type of content you make on that channel mm -hmm. isn't what takes off for you. Um, maybe you'll find an interest in a year's time that suddenly you, you have success with or whatever. So I think the first thing is, is just to get um, a volume of content out there um, after that point, I would just really advise people to think about the attention span of a YouTube viewer. So a lot of people make videos and they'll do stuff like, hey guys, how's it going? Welcome back to the channel. My name is, you know, they do these like typical introductions. And, you know, we're all guilty of this. I did it, you know, a few years ago before I realized in retention that it's just a really bad thing for um, audience retention, which for anyone listening who doesn't know what I mean by audience retention, it's essentially... The, the retention or the re uh, retainment of the, the viewer on a video. So how long they're staying for, what points they click off, and you should give you this really useful retention curve where you can see exactly where someone might have fell off or where someone spiked, which is maybe they rewound and watched again, 
And it gives you a great idea of like the average viewer's experience with the video. Did they watch half the video? Did they watch the whole video? Or whatever. Um, but yeah, being very hyper aware at the start of the audience's uh, rootlessness nature of having all this choice. YouTube is abundance of choice. If you go into a cinema, you've sat down, you've got your popcorn. Even if it is a, like a boring moment to start a movie, you're just going to stick it out and see if it's good. If you're watching TV, you turn on the TV, you look at the, the guide, <laughs> you turn on the TV. Sure, you can reach and turn the controller, but you're kind of invested into it. You've, you've sunk some time into it. On YouTube, you're watching a video and there's seven, eight mm. videos all down the side that are brightly colored on all your favorite interests. So if you give the viewer even this opportunity to consider that they might not want to watch this video anymore, you've lost. So the best advice I can give is make videos that just capture your attention. No, like... No over introducing yourself, no like big explanations about what you're going to do today. Just get into it. Just get into the content, get straight into the, into the video as quickly as possible. The best intros I see are the shortest intros. You don't want to spend 60 seconds introducing the topic. And you also don't want to like, you also want to think about, okay, let's just take the viewers. Let's say, let's say you're making a video on Ethereum and your, your video on Ethereum, which is a cryptocurrency for, for those who don't know, I'm talking about kind of abstract stuff here. Um, if you're making a video on Ethereum, maybe it's like my prediction for Ethereum, like what it's going to get. Is, is it going to go to 25, 5K or something by 2022? What a beginner YouTuber will often do is say, welcome to my channel. I'm going to do a prediction on Ethereum, blah, blah, blah. And then they go, so what is Ethereum? Ethereum is this. And do like a really big introduction on what Ethereum is because they're like, oh, I have to explain what it is. Anyone watching an Ethereum price prediction video knows what Ethereum is. Uh, and like, you know, some people just don't know what it is, but they just don't care. They want to see the price, you know? So spending loads of time introducing these topics that just, you know, are irrelevant to the majority of the audience. And they might say that their rebuttal to that might be, oh, well, some people might not know what it is. So for those who don't know, I'm going to spend two minutes explaining it. And I'm like, you know, it's maths. You, if 90% if of people do know, you know, 90% of your viewers are going to have a negative experience with that part of the yeah. video because they're just going to be like, what is, what are you on about? What are you talking about? So I think being just hyper aware of who your audience is and just who the YouTube audience as a whole is and how rootless they are with where they, where they, the way they consume content. Um, and then after that point, I would say just having a very clear format for your, for your videos um, and, and very clear niche as well. It's always a bit of a mistake. I, I think when people try to, to balance too many things, like maybe they like music and gaming, so they make gaming videos and music videos uh, and rotate them and be like, well, people who like gaming like these videos and people who like music like these videos, it's a win-win. <laughs> like, the, the way YouTube works isn't like that. You're just going to have a split audience where you're probably going to kneecap growth, where you, you probably, if you focused all on music or you focus all on gaming, you might have a lot better success in those individual mm -hmm. areas. But when they're together, you're just, it's like any business. It's like a kind of blurried value proposition to the viewer. Like, what am I getting from this channel? So I would say like having a very clear format for your content. Um, and even to the point of like a format of, of like the structure the videos take. If you look at my channel, every video is quite similar. They even have quite similar thumbnails, which is kind of branding in a way. So people are very familiar with them. They're all around 10 or 11 minutes long. Um, in fact, I think every video I've uploaded in the last two years is between 10 minutes and 12 minutes long. They're all in that length. And that's not like a complete prerequisite. You don't have to make videos all the same length. Any length can kind of work on YouTube. It depends how good the video is. But I think in a way that kind of teaches you to to format your content and get very specific about what kind of videos you're making. So starting out, I always think that's a good step as well to kind of think, what is a Paddy Galloway video? Okay, it's a 10 minute YouTube explanation. Let's reverse engineer it now. What should the first minute be? What should the first two minutes be? What should three, four, five, six minutes throughout the video? Um, that, that's really important. Um, after that point, I think if there's if there's a skill people should really focus on, it's, it's Photoshop. Um, and not just becoming great at photoshopping, you know, random things, because the best graphic designers in the world are not the best thumbnail designers. So that your thumbnail, for, for those who don't know, is just the kind of like the cover art you can upload for a video um, that people see. And if they think it's interesting, they'll click. And it is the thumbnail and title are just as important as the video content itself. Um, for a while, I would have said they're more important. Been a few shifts in how, how YouTube uh, recommends content now where it's just so important to have good retention and have good viewer satisfaction. But for a while, it was just, you know, if you could get the th thumbnail title and thumbnail right, you were golden. Like you could, you could make like a, a pretty poor video, but if you get the title and thumbnail right, you'd still get big views. But now it's a balance, but it's, it's just so important. Um, thumbnail title. So thumbnail wise, 
bright. I can't see how many people I see make dark thumbnails, like dark backgrounds, shaded faces. Like how is that going to stick out against a, a YouTube feed that's full of really bright images? So bright images, vivid colors, think like lots of bright prime colors, like yellows, blues. They're always good to like have in thumbnails. They're not, you know, necessary, but just as an idea, like you see my, my videos, like I have a white background, a big bright red graph, black text and red text, which contrasts against the white background. Then I have the creator and I make the creator really bright. I pump up the saturation and brightness. Mm -hmm. And then I put a little um, stroke effect around the creator, which is like this light green. So when you look at that image, it's just like a color pop. And that's before you even decide if you want to watch the video, it's just grabbing your attention. Um, so yeah, that's, that's probably a, a few different things there, but I think they're the first things I'd look at, like getting good at Photoshop, getting good at making thumbnails and, and just really focusing in on the audience and the YouTube viewer and not making videos where you introduce yourself for five minutes. And, and also on the same, same token, don't make videos where when you've finished delivering the video, you spend five minutes rambling because that's all time that your retention curve is going down and you're losing out on, on value percentage that you could, uh, you could add to your overall retention. That's savage advice there. I think we've got great feedback for anyone who's thinking about starting a YouTube channel. Paddy, what does the future hold? I'll, I'll let you go. We've just hit the R mark now, so I'll let you go in a second. What does the future hold for you? What are the plans for the next kind of six to 12 months? I'm pretty, I'm pretty like chill with it. Um, I mean, that's, you know, you probably get some people on here that's like, I'm doing this, this, this in Q4 or whatever. But the way, <laughs> the way I'm, I'm, I'm taking things now is th things are going really well for me, thankfully. Like I've, I've, I've built a, a business well into the six figures, into the mid six figures. It's been very successful. I'm, I'm very happy with that. Um, and like, I'm not really motivated by, by money per se. So, so like, I don't know, everyone's motivated by money, but after a certain point, it's like, what, what do you enjoy doing? And what do you feel like there's something really valuable you can provide the world? So a vague sort of answer is I'm, I'm looking for ways I can provide even more value to creators. Um, I'm looking for ways I can, I can leverage, um, myself because, you know, consulting is great and I can build, you know, potentially a million or $5 million per year business in consulting if, if things go right, but I'm looking for ways to leverage so I can spread myself across, you know, more channels. Like I, it's not so private, like, you know, you don't, you, you pay Paddy Galloway these high consulting fees and you get them. I want, I want something where, you know, people can afford in different parts of the world. Also maybe, you know, like products or membership groups where mm. anyone can, can get um, advice that can apply to their channel. The difficulty is template advice isn't always the best advice. Yeah. So I need to play it very carefully, but there's lots of things I can do that I think can spread, um, good advice out there and help creators. And really like my goal is like essentially to get a thousand creators, like a gold play button or a diamond play button. Like I want to, I want to help creators grow because I know it's, you know, it's like that thing, like I just love helping people, but genuinely, <laughs> genuinely, like there's nothing, there's nothing more exciting to me than growing a channel. I love it myself for myself. I love the idea of growing a channel. Yeah. So if I can work with people who are more talented with me in, in certain areas, so like I'm not very good at video, like oh, actually I'm, I'm okay at some video games, but like Minecraft, I'm not, I'm not very good at Minecraft. I don't really know the game. But if I, if I work with a Minecraft channel, who's brilliant at the game and it's really entertaining on camera, like I'm, I'm not the most entertaining guy for a young audience. I'm kind of a little monotone, um, you know, I'm not, not serious, but I'm like, I'm not super like, you know, energetic or whatever. So like I can work with people who have skills that I don't have and still get to, you know, become part of that. Maybe it's like an equity in the channel. Maybe it's uh, just, mm. you know, just consulting on a retainer basis, but thing about YouTube advice is there's, there's a, you know, there is a little bit of a ceiling. I can grow this a lot bigger than I, than I am. I can grow this. I feel, I feel like I can grow my channel well into the millions. Um, if, if I still enjoy it, of course, but when I'm working with like a Minecraft channel or an entertainment channel, you know, the sky's the limit with those channels. Like okay. I, I, in the last year, I've probably worked with in some form, whether it's a call or, reta or, or a retainer contract, I've probably worked with. 12 or 13 different Minecraft channels that have over a million subs. And you know, anyone that has over a million subs in Minecraft that is pulling good views. So let's say like 20, 30 million views a month, you know, they're making a lot of money mm. um, and there's a lot of potential there and they're doing their hobby. So I guess I'm just, I'm just always looking for ways to, to leverage what I'm doing, leverage my brand, maybe, maybe have some things I can scale a little bit better. So I don't have to be um, working so hard. I was up at 7am today. I've just, just finished my, uh, my previous work and I, I jump in into this podcast, which has been great, by the way, I've really, really enjoyed it. It's nice. It's like, it's a nice, uh, 
changed to having to just pure present findings or data or whatever to <laughs> nice, more, nice wind relaxed. down for the day yeah patty yeah. i always ask people to recommend a book or resource that's going to help them along the way is there anything that you've enjoyed personally or professionally that you'd recommend great question i threw okay. resource in there because some people asked the question a few times people yeah. are like i don't read books anymore i'm like damn it <laughs> i'm getting yeah. old so like is there like a, a podcast a youtube channel a book or anything that yeah you would recommend? so i actually i actually do read quite a lot um i think like a lot of people come to me and ask for book recommendations for youtube like there's a good book um very good book by daryl Lee's called um the youtube formula um popular book very well researched daryl's a great guy i know him I've, I've talked to him a few times really really nice guy um, so that's always great for people that want like YouTube advice. But really, I like to think about when I think about books and education, I like to think about not necessarily specific like information, because a lot of that is, is kind of always a little hard to apply to yourself. Mm. Like, like that book from Daryl is, is a brilliant book and can teach you a lot about YouTube. But I think there's something to be said for like learning from things that can teach you about maybe the world as a whole or like yourself or like your own philosophies to content. So like, there's a book behind me there. You might not be able to see it. It's just it's just there. Um, it's called Zero to One by Peter Thiel. Oh, yes. Yeah, it is yeah. very good, actually. Peter Thiel is a bit of a crazy guy, but that book, um, I read that book when I was 21. And, you know, I'm not going to attribute everything to that book, but some of the stuff he talked about in that book just made me really reassess mm. how I was approaching business. So we talked about there the fact that I kind of, with my content, I do something a little different to a lot of the other YouTube advice channels. When I was first starting this idea of like maybe doing a YouTube advice channel, I was thinking about doing the kind of face of the camera, nice backlighting, mm. five tips to grow on YouTube. Mm. If I'd done that, I might have, you know, I might might have grown, I might have built a business, but I don't think I would have grown as quickly with as few videos. Um, I don't think I would have had as much impact, which I'm very lucky to have have, have had. Um, because there's a bit in that book which talks about competition and it's talking about like essentially competition is a loser's game in some ways. And you know. People compete in everything. Like I'm still competing for other for attention from with other channels. Like everyone's competing at something. But in a business, not just looking at like what other people are doing in your niche and sort of saying, okay, how can I come at this from a completely new angle and provide something that's very hard to do? So maybe in a small scale my channel is an example of that, because it is actually quite hard to replicate. Because to make those videos, you need to have the credibility. You can't just no like your average Joe on the street can't just start making YouTube videos about how someone grew because no one would listen to them because you know what's their credibility and that's built up over a very long period of time so that was like a, a kind of competitive advantage um you're building your lot, moat yeah yeah the moat like a lot of that stuff came from reading that book so i, I definitely recommend people to check that out especially if you've got like a business mind really really good book um i'd love to give you another recommendation as well because i i do Go it's that thing it. i, I yeah. consume so much content i learned yeah. so much um from so many people but when someone like says what's one thing i'm like oh uh, there's so much um I, I would say the last thing I actually one last thing I'd say is like going back to that same thing about not necessarily like going into a book looking for something. I think if you just read enough books from like smart people and they're not all necessarily like how to do this, like some of them might be just like, you know, I, I read a great book called Sapiens, um, mm. which is just like the the human evolution story. And you could think, how could that teach you anything about YouTube? It might not teach you anything about YouTube, but it might, maybe there's a word in there you learn, or maybe there's something in there that like teaches you something that you start to understand more about human behavior, which might lead to like another thought you have about YouTube or whatever. So I would say just, just embrace learning, like lots of books, lots of podcasts. Um, and obviously just gra gravitate towards what you enjoy. Don't just try, because everyone's reading one book. Don't be just like, oh, I need to read that. Whatever you enjoy, gravitate towards. I love it. Great advice. Good recommendations. Paddy, where can people learn more about you? So give me the name of your channels and your social accounts. Yeah, YouTube, Paddy Galloway. Just type my name in um, and there it is. Just come by. If, if, you, if you're here from the podcast, drop me a comment um, <laughs> and say, say you came from this podcast. Um, and then as well, just social media. My, my uh, Instagram is Paddy Galloway, all one word. And my Twitter is PaddyG96. Um, I'm actually more um, active on Twitter. I post there quite a lot. I post a lot of data, a lot of stuff there. Um, and yeah, if, if anyone is interested in working together or anything like that, I have like links in my bio. So just, just reach out. Perfect. Paddy, thank you so much. It's been an absolutely cracking chat. Very insightful. Thanks for being so detailed. 
yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. We should probably do it again sometime. Love it. Thanks, Paddy. Thank you. And that was my chat with Paddy. I hope you enjoyed it. If you'd like this kind of content, join me every single week here for a new podcast and a new business video where I chart my own business adventures. You can click here to watch the most recent podcast with Rob Lipset, or you can click here to subscribe to the channel. I hope you do. Click there. It's good. I'll see you here back on Monday.